Hello guys, welcome back to What's This Weapon. This one is, is a weapon, but it is a less lethal weapon. Uh, we've covered a riot gun not so, not so long ago. This is in fact also a riot gun. If you're thinking that looks familiar, you might be thinking of the Milcor MGL, um, rotary grenade launcher. It's not that, although they are sometimes confused. You might just have seen it blowing up John Wick's house in John Wick 2. Um, John Wick 4 is upon us already, of course. Um, looking forward to Hopefully by the time this airs, I will have seen it. Anyway, I don't think this is going to make a reappearance. Um, also, it was in, it was in the first uh, Resident Evil, um, and then like hybrid versions of it cropped up later. It was in Never Say Never Again. I think Felix Leiter was using it. Uh, several other movie and pop culture appearances. Uh, there's a rack of them on the Solarco in Aliens, weirdly, as well. Now, apart from that one, all of those appearances have in common that the thing is posing as a grenade launcher. Well, this... The Arwen 37, designed and manufactured by Britain's Royal Small Arms Factory. That's anti-riot weapon Enfield, in keeping with their naming scheme. 37 for 37 millimeter, it is entirely less lethal. It cannot be used for any kind of lethal purpose. And that's to do with how it works. Uh, slightly preempting, talking about the ammunition, but this is your chamber. <laughs> so this thing is open. Um, I'll demonstrate it in a moment. It is using the cartridge case as its own chamber, and so it would not bear the pressures of a lethal round. I wanted to get that out of the way, because as cool as it looks being used on film uh, or in games, it's not a grenade launcher. It is exclusively a riot gun, uh, or less lethal launcher, if you prefer. So this is the fully developed production version. Uh, in fact, we'll just start out by showing you the markings, because it kind of sums up well, encompasses a few different things. So, uh, Enfield, registered trademark at the top, and then rolling, rotating around this tubular receiver, we see R137, a couple of different variants of that logo, and then underneath that we have Royal Ordnance, Nottingham. So, slight contradiction, sorry, Nottingham, England, to give it its full uh, name. And a lot of the ones you'll see pictures of have this set of markings. This was the main production run um, at Nottingham. So slightly contradictory because it references Enfield and Nottingham. And if you know about the, the history of the Royal Small Arms Factory and the Nottingham Small Arms Facility, the one replaced the other. Uh, there's not really any overlap there. So they are still using the Enfield brand, Enfield, sorry, Enfield trademark, not registered trademark, Enfield TM. They're still using the Enfield brand for the Arwen, that's the name of the system, the Enfield Arwen, but they are pointing out that it's now owned by uh, the publicly floated company Royal Ordnance, and they are now based at Nottingham, England, and that's where they're making these. So just to dial this back and give you a bit of the background to this system before we look at how it works, I'm just going to grab some of this series. Now, before we get into that, I should reference that there are, there's the Arwen S, Short, there's the Arwen V for vehicle use without a buttstock, and there's the Arwen Ace, which is a single shot variant. So there's a whole family of weapons. Uh, we'll show you a, a picture of those others. We're just going to focus on the Arwen 37 today. But I'm going to grab a few so that you can see them together and see a bit of the design progression. Right, so this is as much of the Arwen 37 story as we have. Uh, there is a modern ending to this that I'll give you at the end. The XL76E1 is where this starts, and that is this. Very difficult to practice at trigger discipline with this because it has a full height trigger, a four finger trigger, and that's to do with how this system works, which we'll go into in a moment. The basic layout is there, except that it has a solid nylon buttstock, very heavy as well, actually. It's a, a cast and then machined uh, receiver. We have this rotating carousel in the middle for the cartridges with this arm here that's critical to how it works. So the basic design is already there. Some significant changes to come. Um, let's flip the sight up. It has this quite distinctive 
ribbed barrel, which stays with the gun for most of its life, in fact, almost all of its life. The basic feed mechanism, which is a manually operated reciprocating bolt and clockwork carousel for the rounds is on here, non-functional, and in fact the bolt is missing on this prototype, but we're still fortunate to have it. Quickly show you the markings on the top. XL76E1 number one, Gun Riot 37mm. So the project uh, uh, name Arwin came in quite early on, and it actually applied to this and two other designs, which we may feature in the future. Uh, one was a pump action, uh, another was a box-fed, trigger-actuated design, similar to this, but box-magazine-fed, integral box, not removable. And they had their own Excel designations. Uh, pretty quickly, they decided this was the way forward, and they ditched the others. They didn't, um, the pump action didn't meet the, um, the requirements, and I think they just thought the mechanical side of this was much more promising than the box-fed version, which, having had a quick look at it, I would tend to agree with. So that's your, your first prototype. You'll notice the mechanical grenade launcher sights on this thing. They don't carry forward to the rest of the design, but they are sort of custom to the design with range, different range um, reticles effectively on the front side and then a single rear aperture there on the rear. That's that one. Can't demonstrate the action on that one. And unfortunately, the same goes for the second prototype, which is even missing its buttstock. Um, it, it's interchangeable with one of the other designs, so I, I thought about swapping it over, but I don't want to don't do that, really. It's, it's getting there. You'll notice the four-finger trigger. Now, that's to do with overcoming the, the spring tension and resistance of that reciprocating bolt I mentioned. Interestingly, the four-finger trigger has immediately dropped down so this is, 19, this is 1977, the grey one, um, or, or just after that, the requirement, uh, GSR 3607 from the Ministry of Defence for a new riot gun to replace the, the riot guns we covered earlier, or alluded to, the L48, the L67, uh, the Federal riot gun, the, the Shamuli. Those were all stop gaps. They were looking for a dedicated, multi-shot, accurate, less lethal but not ineffective <laughs> launcher and this was the program to find that. So that's 1977. This thing is around pretty quickly. They didn't have very long to, to meet this requirement, just, a, just a 18 months or so I think. Uh, and so that is, a version of that is around in 77. Soon after that we have it redesigned here. Single figure trigger, which is, it doesn't work unfortunately so I can't demonstrate that. That requires an awful lot of trigger pressure and you can't get another finger on there to help yourself with that. So slightly curious choice there, but we are, the, in terms of architecture, we're getting a bit closer to the Arwin that you'll see, uh, the developed Arwin that you saw just now. Tubular receiver, the heart of the mechanism remains the same, a bit refined. Uh, we have now got a safety here, which is a, a simple uh, sliding catch. A rear sight quite reminiscent of the, of the final version, and under that, more markings, and it's the XL76E2. So we go from E1 in grey to E2 in black. And we've now got our transparent front sight, which is a, a feature of the, of the final Arwin as well. Different design, this is a solid bit of perspex with different, different reticles on it. Uh, right from the start, these are rifled, by the way. Both of these prototypes have rifling grooves down the bore. It had been uh, recognised in use in the Troubles that you absolutely needed a spin stabilised batten round to be able to um, not cause undue injury or to try not to cause undue injury. Smooth bore riot guns were, were deemed just unacceptable. That's that one. Incomplete again unfortunately. These things have a hard life in testing. Uh, we're nearly there as far as development goes. This looks very similar to what I showed you at, at the top of the episode. 
And in fact, it's almost the same as the very fancy brochure that we can show you in a moment that they put out in 1985. So we, we've moved on um, several years. They, they'd met the initial requirement, um, well, in theory, except MOD were not biting. They put out the requirement, but they were unconvinced by, by any of the options, essentially. So this is very similar to what came out, what was first made at Enfield and offered around the world for sale. It's gone, they've gone back from the, the very thin ribs on the XL76E2. They've reverted to the sort of wavy ribs on the barrel. Uh, this, this is, as far as I can tell, simply a way to reduce the weight of an aluminium barrel. Doesn't require to be, doesn't have to be steel, low pressure rounds and everything. Um, it also makes it quite easy to grab by the barrel if you have to. Um, I didn't quite get to the bottom of the design thoughts there. There was nothing immediately apparent as to why they'd done it. Uh, this one's dated 1981, so they had, um, I think they sort of scraped in in terms of giving MOD what they'd asked for uh, in that sort of time frame. And this one is marked up just for Enfield because Nottingham was not a thing yet, not for small arms. Uh, so Arwen-37. That term Arwen applies to, the, to all three of those weird prototypes, initial prototypes. But it's the term, um, as far as production guns go, Arwen means this rotary system. Oddly, we've still got the single finger trigger, and this one does just about function, but it's a bit uh, out of whack, shall we say. So I'll, I'll demonstrate on the, the Nottingham made gun. Now, there are various other features to this, to this design but we thought we might let uh, a friend from the 1980s explain some of those to you in this clip. Weighing only 3.1 kilograms, the Arwen 37 has a five round rapid fire capability, a rifled barrel, and fold down calibrated sights ensuring optimum accuracy. The butt length is adjustable for operator comfort, and the three position front grip is suitable for either left or right hand operation. Loading is fast with any combination of ammunition rounds. With no cocking necessary, automatic function and ejection cycle, topping up the chamber is possible at any time. Search and check for hidden devices. OK, so they're the three developmental guns we have in this series. Brings us back to this Nottingham-made gun. So let's get these guys off the table and just have a look in detail at how this thing is working. So we're back on the, on the Nottingham gun now. Let me just flip up those sights. Uh, to add a little bit of detail to what our friend told us about the sights, uh, well, let's get a good view of them first. So red and black on a transparent leaf, which is, I mean, anecdotally, uh, well, not anecdotally, sorry, from, <laughs> from initial trials, um, the, there's some concern over daylight causing problems. And, and admittedly, you don't see many front sights made out of transparent material but they are still on the gun today. So um, I don't think, in the, in the final analysis, I don't think that was a problem. So there you are. That's your reticle, different ranges. And it's from, you have to add a zero, so 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 meters. And then a simple rear aperture shaped like a funnel. So you're seeing the, the narrow end of that as you look at it now. I say single rear aperture, there is a plug here that you can punch out that opens up a second rear aperture. Now that is for emergency close range use. So if you have to use it within the 20 meter um, safe minimum for whatever reason, you would have issued it with this removed. If you don't do that, you're out of luck. <laughs> um, and then you would have the front sight folded down. And on this iteration of the gun, the front aiming notch is under the perspex or under the, the transparent plastic. So it's a little bit hard to see through that. Now this may have gone a bit opaque with age, but still. Um, the original version, there's a notch in the perspex. I, expect, I suspect they had problems making that out in daylight as well. And so they've moved it to the um, cylinder that the site is rotating upon. So that's your emergency sighting system. Flip that back up. Uh, this one, at this point, the adjustable front grip does not appear to be adjustable. It's screwed into place. I mean, it's adjustable by an armourer, 
but not by the user. I um, don't know if that's a choice or not. And our, our design has reached a point where we've got a, a polymer, not quite lower receiver, but sort of middle receiver, trigger group really, that slides over the body, the, the tubular uh, body, and locks into place. And we've, we're back to a multi-finger trigger. And it's a two-finger, they've compromised ultimately on a two-finger trigger. The safety is both sides. I've turned it around anyway. It's on both sides, so down for safe. Up for fire. The adjustable stock you saw, saw demonstrated, um, multiple positions for that. Not convenient to adjust in the field, you'd have to set it before you um, head it out. Now you also saw in the clip how, that, how this thing works, but we'll, can, we can show you a bit in a bit more detail of course here. So we've got three, this is the capacity is five, but we've got three of these empty cases. They are empty. Uh, we'll cover ammunition in a moment. And I'll just show you how they, how they load in. So over the top of the weapon, and you push against the clock spring of the carousel, and it locks into place. You just put another one in, click, and one more. And each time that's latching into place. And then with our double trigger, we can show how this works. This how this works. So this, the reciprocating bolt that's operated essentially on a double action trigger mechanism, as you squeeze that trigger, do you see the cartridge case is ratcheting forwards? Or levering forwards, I should say. And that's obturating. So at that point, it's a two-stage trigger essentially. At that point, it is obturated, gas sealed, in other words, into the breech. And this is now the chamber of the firearm. That's a bit loose. It's not all the way in. <laughs> interestingly, but nonetheless, that's how it would work. And then we pull through to fire, <laughs> takes a lot of trigger pressure. It's something like a, a 14 pound initial pull and then a 16 to 17 pound trigger pull stacking on top of that. So the overall trigger pull is very, very strong. Now that's not a big problem with a riot gun like this. In fact, it's a safety plus really, but it does, it does mean that ideally you want it in, in a proper firing position a little bit awkward to be pulling the trigger this way. Now I'm still holding the trigger down. You heard the firing pin go. The round has gone down range. If I then release the trigger, so hopefully you've, you've grasped how that works. I'll do one for the camera without a round in. Uh, well, I'll just show you the bolt moving back and forth. So there's essentially a great big lever on the bottom of the trigger and it is levering the bolt forward and that's the first pressure taken up. That's the firing pin being re uh, released, having obviously been first drawn back against the spring inside and I'm still holding the trigger and at the point of release you see the bolt slide back and it lets the carousel flick to the next position and obviously with rounds loaded, your next round is ready to fire. So that's the system, it's, it's very clever. So that just leaves the ammunition. Um, we don't have the entire range to show you, unfortunately, but we do have some nice cutaways. Now, just very briefly, this is the original prototype Arwen round with its very thin rim. You see the, the, the rim is rebated, it's smaller in diameter than the diameter of the case also very thin uh, and not reloadable. It's a simple um, pre-installed primer. Once it's fired, you've, you've got to send it back to the factory for reloading. And you can see it has uh, about the standard uh, bat baton round in there. Now, quite early on, they had, and uh, let me show you the AR-1 munition for the fully developed Arwen. So you've got a date on here of 1982, uh, when the very first um, of, the, of the final series was released marked Arwen AR-1. The AR-1 munition is the baton round, the standard baton round for riot control. And this basic design was finalized quite early on, this sort of tadpole shaped round. Um, if you saw our previous riot gun video, very similar sort of shape, but it's a solid cylinder. Well, this is now, uh, flies better through the air. It has a, 
a, a built-in skirt to help gas seal down the barrel, so you're getting consistent velocity, which is important for controlling how lethal the projectile is or isn't, um, and reaching out to the range you want to shoot at. And at the base of the tail, that slips over a reloadable 44 Magnum cartridge case. So you can, as a police armourer, punch out the fired um, blank and install another blank to act as a primer. It's just a 44 Magnum cartridge case, uh, cut down, I should say. So that's the AR-1. You can see that's been fired, hopefully. It's got rifling engraving on the PVC. And it has a, a curved nose. So you'll see uh, today different coloured versions of that still in use. That's the AR-1. And then the others that we have here in this um, sort of mini plastic bandolier here are sectioned. So we've got Arwin AR-2. That's CS. So irritant, cloud of uh, irritant smoke gas, effectively. And it's a multi-source round. Uh, so each one of these little discs, these little pucks, release, burns or, or uh, initiates and releases a its own cloud of CS gas or OC pepper spray gas. Uh, you, can, you can have them loaded with either, I gather, or you certainly could at the time. This also shows you the truncated 44 Magnum round with its fake propellant in there and a sort of um, sabo style cup at the base of the round so that that acts like a shot cup in a shotgun round and then these individual four pucks go flying off down range this bit is just a, a polymer cap to keep it all sealed against moisture and everything else so that that's an important round for the r1 as well there's a training version of that that's the ar2p there's then the ar3 now this is cs as well but it's frangible so it's basically a replica of the, of the AR-1 projectile, but with a frangible head. So that's designed to break apart and release um, CS. These have their own sort of tactical niches that I don't pretend to, to fully understand. Um, and then finally, this is a really weird one. So I, I've spoken to the, to the, the current Arwin guys um, and some contacts, and we don't know what this is. It's in a case uh, that, that's marked AR5. Well, that's not what the AR5 is. And it is a very heavy, solid turned aluminium, some sort of barrier pen penetration round. So punching through a door or a barricade and then releasing some sort of gas, most likely. Uh, I dare say it was too lethal. Um, it's far too heavy for, for that purpose. So the other rounds we don't have, AR4, so that's an aluminium bodied uh, smoke round for, for concealment. So if you're using it to cover an advance of, of SWAT teams or something. And the AR5, the real AR5 is a composite plastic projectile, which is the, the barrier defeating round. So the fact that this has been this one's been remarked AR5, this may well have been the prototype for the AR5, but I can't even guarantee that this case goes with this round, unfortunately. And then later we had developed the AR6. Uh, which is OC or CS powder, which is immediately dispersed through the muzzle. So it's like a CS gas shotgun, effectively. So it doesn't launch out and then discharge the, the irritant. It shoots irritant into the air. So uh, it seems like a bit of a niche one. So there are six rounds available for this thing. OK, so main production starts in 1984 at Enfield, transfers over to Nottingham, uh, as did everything else, sort of 2000. Oh, sorry, 1980. Oh, damn. Transfers over to Nottingham, uh, 1989. This one's dated 1989, in fact. And then Nottingham itself, unfortunately, closes in 2001. But the rights have already been purchased. So the company, uh, Police Ordnance Limited in Canada, had, was already uh, selling the Enfield Arwen, and then from Nottingham uh, over in Canada. Uh, they're still going today, and they purchased all of the rights in 2000 from British Aerospace, who took over Royal Ordnance. So they were already a going concern, selling, uh, assembling and selling Arwens by the time poor old Nottingham as a factory closed down. Uh, and Nottingham Small Arms Facility carried on as a, as a branch of H&K, and the whole SA80 story is tied into that. But Police Ordnance is still going. Um, you can head over to their website and check out the current incarnation. So there's a, there are Mark I and Mark II, 
Uh, the Mark II, we believe, is what was being produced at Nottingham, so this one, and it's pretty minor changes as far as manufacturing goes uh, to most likely to fit the modern tooling that was installed at Nottingham. So functionally for the user, the Mark I, Mark II, no real difference. They're not marked up as such. But when police ordinance retooled it again, redesigned it with a couple of tweaks, uh, in 2003, I believe that was released. That's the Mark III R1, and that's what uh, police forces and security services today can buy. And the major change there, we hope to get one at some point, major change there is a humped receiver that we don't have here with a groove into which fits their mount that hangs over here and you get a Trigicon reflex sight that goes on there. Far better than the iron sights, but in fact, way back in ni circa 1980, um, 81, Enfield were already talking about putting a, a reflex type optic on the Arwen. They just didn't get around to it, but it's the, the Canadians that did. Um, so thank you for them for, for their help um, with some of the facts here. So um, I sometimes feel quite bad that I'm sort of ragging on British firearms design on this series. It's inevitable, given that we have a lot of experimental stuff that didn't quite work. But this is not that. This is a successful Enfield design, and it's still being made and sold today. Initially, these were sold to Canadian and US police departments in the 1980s. They've gone all over the world since then. Uh, they've, they've cropped up in Hong Kong, uh, the Middle East. It's a very viable, very capable, modern-day less lethal system. And it isn't just for controlling riots. Um, it has become used as a tactical option. You'll see British police using a single shot H and K launcher to achieve all the same things that police forces in other, other parts of the world are using this for, but they get five shots if they need them. And one bonus that they were pushing back in the 80s as well, you can leave one space on the carousel free and then if you know you need a barrier penetration round to get to someone behind cover, you can slot that in. If you know you need a baton round to take out guys that are charging you or something, you can slot that in. You can kick off with whichever round you like from, from a belt and then fall back on the four you already have preloaded. So it's, it's a very flexible, very capable system, and that's why it's still in use uh, 40 years later.